think we're going to begin. Uh, this next panel is entitled Self Made Cultural Production Outside of Industry. And our first speaker is Abigail DeCosnick, Associate Professor at, in the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. She's the, the author of the wonderful book, Grove Archives Digital Cultural Me Memory and Media Fandom, which was published in 2016 from MIT Press. And her articles on media fandom, popular digital culture, and performance studies have been widely taught. She's the co-editor of the edited essay collection, The Survival of Soap Opera, Transformations for a New Media Era. The next speaker will be Cecilia Palmeiro, who is an academic, a writer, and an activist, whose book on self-published literature in Latin America is currently being translated from Spanish into Portuguese for a Brazilian edition. She's a professor of contemporary Latin American cultural studies at NYU in Buenos Aires. And along with her scholarly work, she's the author of a novel entitled Cat Power. She's also a key member of the Ni Una Minos Feminist Collective that just had a big action yesterday for International Women's Day. And responding to these talks will be Natalia Pizuela, associate professor in the departments of film and media and Spanish and Portuguese at UC Berkeley. She's the author of three books on photography, Photography and Empire, After Photography, and The Matter of Photography in Americas, which accompanies an exhibition of the same name that she has co-curated for Stanford University's Art Museum at the Cantor Arts Center. A truly invaluable exhibition, and I encourage all of you to go and uh, try to see that while it's up. She's currently at work on a study of time as critique in contemporary art and media from the global south. So please join me in welcoming Abigail Tosman. Thank you so much to Julia, to Lauren, to Megan, to all of you for making today as wonderful and special an event as it is. It's my privilege and pleasure to be here. And today I'll be engaging in a piece of speculative nonfiction that I hope you will uh, help me with called Piracy is the Future of Culture, Speculating About Media After Collapse. So a few years ago I wrote a white paper for MIT called Piracy is the Future of Television. And you can download that, it's up on the internet. You can pirate it, but you can also just download it uh, for free. Um, and it is about how broken cable and broadcast television are, basically, and how internet pirates are forming a new distribution model that most people use for free that is just far better. Um, not only is it free and cheaper, but it's just far better um, a distribution network than traditional broadcast or cable. As we all know, we're, uh, many of us are beholden to these cable wars. You know, we're held hostage by Comcast or Time Warner. Um, so media pirates ignore existing official authorized traditional pay systems of distribution, and they are DIY distributors. Uh, so that's one of my interests, is just in internet media piracy as a phenomenon that's been growing and growing. None of my interests, as Julia said, is in rogue archives or unofficial amateur volunteer hacker run archives of digital media content. Um, so I'm interested in the question of how fans of pirates, volunteers and hackers, amateurs and DIY people preserve their own culture, their own online you know, media. Um, and a third, uh, a third group of things that fed into this talk was that last summer at the Venice uh, Research Pavilion, which was the, the one research you know, part of the Venice Biennale, and at all of the global art events I went to last year, Documenta, the Manchester International Festival, and especially a large exhibit at the MHKA Contemporary Art Museum in Antwerp on um, what was called the Four Futures, Everything I saw in, uh, over the course of last summer was all about um, basically the impending environmental degradation. Uh, what is going to happen to our planet once uh, the tipping point has been reached, which many people think we have already reached that point. So art is very concerned with this question, and I've begun to speak very openly about living, right now all of us living, in the early collapse. And that's not my theory. Uh, collapse theory has been with us for several decades. So this talk combines some of my major research interests in internet piracy and collapse. 
Okay, I'm going to start just by showing a piece of um, research slash art that my husband Benjamin DeCosta and I created together, which is a real time, um, almost minute by minute, we'll call it every two or three minute uh, scrape of um, the BitTorrent swarm around the season opener of Game of Thrones last year. Game of Thrones is a popular HBO fantasy series. Um, Personally, I believe it's the most pirated media property in the world right now. Uh, in advance of the final season, which is airing next year, we put together a scraping tool and a quantification and mapping visualization tool that allows us to see how the world pirates Game of Thrones. So this is the planet Earth and how it pirates Game of Thrones starting um, from about three hours after Game of Thrones aired on a Sunday night. And uh, the cooler colors are lower resolution files, the warmer colors are higher resolution files, the diameter of the, um, of the sort of nimbus around any geographical location is how much activity, how much seeding and peering is happening in that location at any given time. The names of um, places that appear are the places where the most activity is happening. So you can see Seoul is very active <laughs> right now, and then at a certain point Seoul will go to sleep. Athens is sort of getting into the game. Um, Toronto is, you know, like always on fire. Go to Toronto. Um, and uh, also there, there's some other things you'll notice, like uh, there is a kind of global north and south divide in terms of resolution. That's one thing that's interesting. Uh, another thing is how every place there are people, including the United States of America, there are pirates. So the United States of America could access Game of Thrones legally, but it just doesn't. I mean, it's just pirate, you know, and, not, and it doesn't just pirate it, but it's not like, oh, if there's a legal option, people will not use this unauthorized option. Even if there is a legal sanctioned official option, people will use this unauthorized way. And um, elsewhere, I argue that's not just because it's free, it's because the delivery system is actually better and organized in a more logical uh, way. Okay, this is a, uh, just a static map of the cumulative piracy of Game of Thrones over 28 days. And again, you'll see where there are people, there are pirates, except for large swaths of Africa. And Mexico is also a bit underrepresented. So what is going on? In Mexico, a lot of that has to do with um, how bandwidth gets distributed um, past the port cities where the international cables are affixed, basically. So um, that's just a cumulative map. Here are some other cumulative maps that show spread or distribution, you know, rate of activity according to file resolution. And here's one with every form of data we could find just because it makes an interesting image, interesting to me. Okay, now we're gonna, so that's some about piracy. Now we're going to turn to collapse. Responsible for what may be the greatest preventable holocaust in the history of planet Earth. I have 30 years of experience as an investigative journalist. I've broken major scandals. I'm going out to try and map how the world really worked as opposed to the way we were told it worked. Our map has proven deadly accurate. My economic predictions are we have it so right. In 2006, we said, get out of debt right now. Check your mortgage carefully. We issued a whole series of warnings. There will be nothing like we have ever seen before. Everything that we said was going to happen is taking place right now. Gold prices, <laughs> Pakistan, Afghanistan, the stock market. It's not that Bernie Madoff was a pyramid scheme. The whole economy is a pyramid scheme. Of course I've been called a conspiracy theorist, but I don't deal in conspiracy theory, I deal in conspiracy fact. <laughs> the mortal blow in human industrialized civilization will happen when oil prices spike and nobody can afford to buy that oil and everything will just shut down. Unlike the Great Depression, we do not have infinite resources. Nothing grows forever. There is a cycle. Birth, growth, maturation, decline, and death. Cars don't run, uh, mail stops getting delivered, planes don't fly, law enforcement stops working. This is all part of the collapse. If you're in a camp and a bear attacks, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You only have to be faster than the slowest camper. Ah! <laughs> you have to believe 
believe, not hope, not pray, that there's a way out of it, and you're going to find it. So that's uh, Michael from Para, who it, I call him a crackpot. He definitely <laughs> is. Um, he's really funny to watch. I actually really recommend this film. It works on a lot of different levels. Uh, this was a film, this is a documentary that basically just interviews Michael from Para about his collapse theory um, that was released in 2009. You know, Travis Sundance garnered a lot of attention. And it's one of the ways that mainstreaming of collapse theory has begun to happen. And you could say something like Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth is another one of those texts that has begun to introduce collapse theory to more people. But what is collapse theory? Um, the most, I would say the most prominent theorist of collapse is Jim Dater. He is a professor of political science, a director of the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. He's been writing on the four futures for decades. 2009 is the text that I'm citing from, but it is certainly not the first of his articulations of the four futures. Um, Jim Dater's theory is that there are four possible futures for any group, culture, community, civilization. One is continuation. Continuation is the official view of the future of all modern governments, educational systems, and organizations. The purpose of government, education, and all aspects of life in the present and recent past is to build a vibrant economy, develop the people, institutions, and technologies to keep the economy growing and changing forever. So one way to think of the continuation future is just capitalism. Whatever capitalism tells you, it intends for you to think that the slope is always going upwards, the market's always growing, the stock market will always be getting above 10,000, you know, up to 20,000 one day. That that is the there. That's the future that capitalism is constantly envisioning for us. The second possible future, says Dater, is collapse. Um, he writes, growing fears that might cause our fragile, overextended, and heavily interconnected globalized world to collapse, either to extinction or to a lower stage of development than it currently is. Collapse and extinction is always a possible future for any community or organization. The collapse future is not and should not be portrayed as a worst case scenario. So he doesn't, uh, equi he doesn't make equivalent collapse and, I don't know what we call, you know, disaster apocalypse, the end of the world. Or rather, even in such disaster and apocalypse scenarios, um, that's not the end and it's not a disaster for everybody. Uh, he writes, um, many people welcome the end of the economic rat race and yearn for a simpler lifestyle. Moreover, in every disaster, there are winners as well as losers. So collapse is an uneven and unequal um, event. The third future is discipline. Uh, he writes, some feel that continued economic growth is unsustainable. Continued growth may be coming to a halt, whether we like it or not. Thus, these people argue we need to refocus our economy and society on survival and fair distribution and not on continued economic growth and orient our lives around a set of fundamental values. Life should be disciplined around these fundamental values. And there are many prophets or advocates of the disciplined future, but uh, one of them is Karl Marx. So when you see, as opposed to the continuation future of, um, of you know, capitalism, when you see the disciplined future, you might think of the way that Marxism stresses um, not endless growth, but a kind of redistribution of what we've got, um, to be very simplistic. And then the last of the four futures is transformation. The fourth alternative future focuses on the transforming power of technology, especially robotics and AI, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, teleportation, space settlement, and the emergence of a dream society as the successor to the information society. The transformational society anticipates and welcomes the transformation of all life into a new post-human form as part of the extension of intelligent life from Earth into the solar system and eventually beyond. And so when you see transformation future, just think Star Trek. Um, this is absolutely Gene Roddenberry's future uh, that he envisioned for us in the 60s. And at the same time, we have to think about Elon Musk who wishes, or you know, all of Silicon Valley, Elon Musk as a kind of avatar for all of big tech, um, which envisions for us a future in which we don't have to worry about discipline because we're all going to transform into some other kind of species and that transformation will solve a lot of our problems. Now, um, I'm well aware that collapse 
has happened before, and Jim Dater would say that too. I come from the Philippines also, like Chas, who asked that great question earlier. And uh, any person who has come from a colonized people knows very well that their people have already lived through a collapse. At the same time, I think that um, colonizing societies would say that they impose a transformation on those societies. So I think that what kind of future has already happened in our past depends, you know, the future is in the eye of the beholder. So what looks like collapse to some group of people might look like transformation to another group. Or it might just look like um, continuation. It might just look like that's what capitalism needed to do. It needed to expand. It needed to go outside the borders of the United Kingdom and make the kingdom bigger. Uh, all right, so signs of early collapse. Here are some things that happened in 2017, and these aren't the first signs of collapse. But as I said, uh, these are the. This is the time when I've, you know, 2017 was when I started to just articulate that we're living in early collapse. A lot of places that I go, or any time apocalypse comes up, just to note that this is the discourse that we're in. So in 2017, some things that happened: we had extreme weather, uh, record temperature highs globally, devastating hurricanes in the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean, the California wildfires, which were due to this extreme weather pattern of high rainfall followed by record heat. Puerto Rico, post-Hurricane Maria, you know, that ending of the 2009 documentary collapse is not too different. That's sort of a speculative array, montage of images of disaster, but they're not too different than the actual images we got from Puerto Rico last fall and continue to get. So um, actually, this is some recent data. Puerto Rico is still, as of March, uh, one, 2018, still in the throes of the longest and largest blackout in U.S. history, uh, following Hurricane Maria as of March 1, 12.5% uh, of utility customers on the island still can turn on their lights, refrigerate food, or run water pumps, and let's remember that customer refers to one um, power meter, so that's a whole household of people, it's usually more than one uh, person. And no electricity means no power to pump water into homes, no water to bathe or flush toilets, 80% of the crop value has been wiped out. This is affected a lot of things, including everyday communications. Um, I just want to put up this um, this chart, sort of famous chart uh, by Klinger, which is uh, what we lose when we lose power. And you'll notice at the top is mental health. But a lot of other things happen when um, we were, are without electrical power, like light and temperature control and clean water and transport and so on. All right, now I'm going to turn to what big tech is doing in the time of early collapse. It is advancing it. Uh, one way that big tech is doing that is they are underpaying taxes to federal and state governments, so they're just not supporting the existing infrastructure of society. So infrastructure, um, meaning both things like road, like physical things, but also things like schools, like UC Berkeley, are under more threat, are more precarious, are more in danger of collapsing because the, some of the largest revenue earners in our society are not paying for the sustenance of that infrastructure. Uh, another thing that big tech is doing um, is they're welcoming bad actors. I'm talking about social media companies, basically. Uh, welcoming bad actors and allowing them to exercise influence on high numbers of people, including voters, which undermines leadership mechanisms. That's something that has not just happened in our country, um, but has, is a phenomenon that's happened in many, many um, places that call themselves democracies. And uh, another thing that's happening is that the wealthy tech elite um, you know, the 1% of the 1% is basically doing doomsday prep. So they're preparing to save themselves in the eventuality of a collapsed future, uh, but they're not helping to keep their, even their own infrastructure, meaning like just internet infrastructure. They're not looking to keep that infrastructure running after the collapse. Instead, the collapsed future they envision for themselves personally is what the New Yorker calls doomsday prep, which is the building of large bunkers you know, usually underground somewhere, or for example, in New Zealand, there's been a kind of run on New Zealand real estate by US tech millionaires who have been, for the first time in New Zealand's history, able to buy citizenship um, very quickly. And that's in order to build their sort of post-collapse um, dwellings. So that's what big tech is doing. <laughs> okay. What that is, the, all of that is to say that we cannot count on the internet as we know it after collapse. And if we can't count on the internet as we know it, what can we count on to preserve the culture that we have today into the future? Well, what about piracy? How might piracy 
help maintain the contemporary media culture post-collapse. So here is where um, the speculation really begins. One thing I will um, propose is that media piracy might motivate people to participate in a mesh network. And mesh networks already exist. For example, the Athenian Wireless Metropolitan Network, the AWMN, connects um, almost 3,000 computers built by linking rooftop Wi-Fi antennas to create a mesh. Uh, it's a user-controlled autonomous network. And it solves that last mile problem. Remember when I said Mexico, for example, has a bit of underrepresentation in media piracy, perhaps because of the penetration of bandwidth into the center of the country from the coast. So mesh networks solve the last mile problem of how to get an unserved or underserved community access to the internet's backbone, meaning the physical infrastructure, fiber optic, telephone, and TV cables that carry data. And media content can be streamed from private pirate archives on MeshNet. So this is a quote um, about the uh, Athenian uh, Mesh Network that says, uh, this is from one of the users, it's like a whole other web, it's our network, but it's also a playground. Indeed, the Mesh has become a major social hub. There are blogs, discussion forums, a Craigslist knockoffs. They've held movie nights where one member streams a flick and hundreds tune in to watch. Well, it's not called piracy in this article, but that's definitely what that is. Uh, so, one thing that we might think about is perhaps we need as many people as possible to pirate and archive as much media as they can pre-collapse, meaning right now. Um, preservation and access through redundancy and multi-sidedness. So instead of relying, for example, on something like the Library of Congress or the UC Berkeley um, PFA to preserve our culture going forward, perhaps the answer, the better solution, would be for each of us to save as much culture as we possibly can right now. Uh, will pirate protocols be more helpful when electrical power and network access are intermittent? So one thing that we're seeing in Puerto Rico and elsewhere and might see more and more of in a post-collapse scenario is not 24-7 power but power that is more characterized by brownouts and blackouts and it's just more intermittent. So what can piracy help with in that scenario? One thing that pirates understand is sharing ratios. So the more you upload, the more you can download. There's no such thing as free writing. You don't just use the network um, as much as you want to infinitely with no consequences. If you're a pirate, then you already understand that you have to share as much as you take, at least as much as you take from the network, usually it's a sort of overshare. Uh, pirates also understand file spanning, which is the breaking of large files into smaller files and recombining the smaller files back into the original file. This is called unrarring, for those of you that have ever seen that file extension, dot R-A-R, that's what that means. Um, so transmitting much smaller files, breaking up a large file into many small pieces, and then transmitting them when you can, is a much uh, easier way to deal with intermittent power than trying to transmit, for example, a, a high-res version of a 120-minute of a film will be at least 2.7 gigs. So instead of trying to get that across the network all at once, in an intermittent power scenario, you might have to break that up into many, many little files. Pirates also understand that some times, meaning some times of day, are better for network traffic than others. Pirates are used to timing their network use because they know that they place high demands on the network, so they already treat bandwidth as a somewhat scarce and fluctuating resource. Um, will pirates be able to help people understand how to optimize their network use post-collapse? Uh, maybe pirates can be educators, counselors, models, framework, and vocabulary providers, because uh, by practicing piracy today, uh, they will already know how to use a network without, a big, without big centralized corporate systems telling them how to do that. But what if mesh nets do not survive? I know you've already thought about that. Uh, what if there is not enough power to power even the mesh nets, or what if the collapse uh, severely injures the fiber optic cables? Um, many things could happen to the existing infrastructure. Uh, one answer that, um, what do they call themselves, uh, global crisis experts have come up with is radio. Radio will survive the collapse of even the mesh nets. 
So this is uh, something from The Guardian UK, um, an interview with Nafiz Ahmed, who is one of those global crisis experts. And uh, Ahmed says that the basic method of acquiring information, this is post-collapse, will be a wind-up or solar-powered radio. However, to actually communicate with the outside world or with members of your community, you may be back to walkie-talkies, two-way radios, or even a citizen band radio. That's not so different than a mesh net. I mean, those are basically very similar networks. Um, so what about post-collapse pirate radio? Pirate radio workers may be able to help communities build their radio networks. We've had, you know, we have a long history of pirate radio now. Um, pirates can broadcast their media collections over radio, so that would be interesting to see if individuals were interested in hosting their own shows where they broadcast whatever they've managed to save. Pirates can also learn to convert audiovisual media into oral or sound culture for radio broadcasts. So what about a kind of translation of audiovisual culture into a more sonic culture? Uh, what about audio description, which right now is used for um, visually impaired audience members who go to, for example, plays or museums and listen to <coughs> audio descriptions of visual images in headphones. That's kind of a common accessibility uh, feature provided by cultural institutions today for a disabled population. But what if we were able to do audio description of Citizen Kane? Um, audio description of gestures, of action, of settings, the return of the radio play format. And in that scenario, should pirates be downloading a lot of scripts and not as many um, texts, or maybe scripts with texts, uh, as well as books, articles, play scripts, to facilitate a post-collapse uh, radio play culture? Is text piracy even more important than audiovisual piracy for post-collapse culture? All right, thank you. Wow. Oh. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for inviting me here, and Natalia for making it possible. Seeing Beba for coming with me, I feel so um, in the tide, in the feminist tide here. Um, so I will present uh, with a very amateur PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that reflects the aesthetics I want to communicate. Um, so this research I'm about to present is a long-term academic, political, and personal project that started with my doctoral dis dissertation at Princeton University, published mm -hmm. as a book as Les Bonde Felicidad in 2011, in also an amateur um, underground uh, publishing house that now grew bigger, and continues until this very present moment with the organization of the Second International Women's Strike and the emergence of what I would like to call feminist avant-garde as a distinctive feature of this feminist revolution. This revolution is deeply connected with new artistic practices that challenge the commodification of art. This research started with a question regarding the political prerogatives of my own generation after the genocide of the former generation during the, mil the last military dictatorship in Argentina. And it's about our relationship with politics and the markets in the context of uh, the economic collapse around 2001, when was, uh, there was a, a pre-apocalypse uh, economic collapse in Argentina and political collapse at the same time, so it was like a reset, uh, everything uh, was, had to be new. I would like to address the formation of a very contemporary trend in Latin American literature from the perspective of amateurism as a critical relation with the market and with the institution we call literature, which is an exclusionary canon. This specific process of fusing art and life established the conditions of a feminist avant-garde that is now spreading over the continent and around the world. To start, I would like to play with uh, a set of concepts to think uh, through the dissolution of art into life in the present context. Those con the concepts are avant-garde and post-autonomy. I would like, I would try to elaborate on the idea of a feminist avant-garde as the avant-garde of post-autonomy. 
According to Argentinian writer and critic Ricardo Piglia, in his book Tres Vanguardias, there are three main types of avant-garde. The first avant-garde, beginning in the 19th century, of course from the perspective of literature, and practiced by writers such as Rambaud or Baudelaire, can be described as the radical negation of the laws of society and the rules of art that came before. For them, art is a sort of uh, war trench from which to shoot against the bourgeois society. A second form of avant-garde thinks politicization as a re-functionalization or functional transformation of the means of production related to what Walter Benjamin analyzed in the classic text, uh, The Author as Producer. Uh, in Argentinian literature, this trend was practiced by uh, Rodolfo Walsh and later by Eloisa Cartonera and Vegetti Felicidad, as I will further elaborate. A third kind of avant-garde relates to the critical occupation of the cultural industry and the reassessment of popular uh, feminine sensibility, as Manuel Puig did in his novels that became extremely popular. So this trend re relates to the um, new evaluation of the queer feminized subculture and its inscription into high literature, a founding moment of the tradition of what I call las lenguas de las locas, the, the tongues of the mad women or the queens, I will explain later, that we'll present in a few moments. Another enlightened concept developed by Argentinian uh, critic Josefina Lugner is post-autonomy. Post-autonomy explains a specific contemporary relation between literature and society in terms of the transformation of reading and writing practices in the digital age. Internet and the new autobiographic genres that emerged online blurred the borders of literature and contaminated it with the real, with life itself. This fusion of art and life does not depend on the artist's decision, as it did in, in avant-garde, but it's a technical, a structure, structural condition of these forms of writing. Post-autonomy then refers to the impact of the digital mode of production on, on writing and on the production of subject, subjectivity and identity. By reading the literary production of, um, of a political, economic and institutional crisis in Argentina around 2001, I had the chance to observe that many of the projects run by young artists and writers, mainly in the art gallery and publishing house Belleza y Felicidad, in Spanish means beauty and happiness, and Eloisa Cartonera, would escape from what was traditionally considered strictly, strictly literary. These writing and publishing experiences were at the same time more than literature and less than literature. More than literature in the sense that they linked themselves to other social practices as form of political intervention, and less than literature, because literature was, until that moment, a space dominated by male perspectives with little to no space for the written production of women, queer, and other non-binary people. Since the big names that shape the national literary canon are always masculine, not to say macho, Feminized voices and perspectives were considered minor and outsiders to the Hall of Fame of the lettered city. The 2001 crisis made clear that a radical act could not be circumscribed to the literary sphere, especially when we had the sensation that all the spheres were collapsing, and that the, criti the, criti oh, sorry, that the crisis of political representation also affected other discur discursive practices, questioning the very existence of a literary sphere and redefining the political conflicts in which they sought to intervene. Since the concept and practice of representation was at stake, it can be argued that the crisis was not only economic, but also a crisis of the unconscious, aiming to question and transform normal subjectivity, which is a fuel of capitalism. This crisis of the capitalistic subjectivity produced the conditions for a process of becoming different as a collective process of desire. This writing revolution was deeply connected to the flourishing of local queer activism in the crossroads of the importation of queer theory, coming exactly from here, <laughs> translated into the lens of former experiences with the politics of difference in the 70s. These new conditions of production of literature and subjectivity 
produce an historical rescue of for forgotten experiences of aesthetic politicization. In order to produce a radically new literature, the young Argentinian writers of 2001 rescued a practically unknown experience of literarization of life from the recent past in Brazil, the movement vaguely called Poesia Marginal, Marginal Poetry, which was a trend developed by young artists during the last military dictatorship in Brazil as a form of resistance against the dictatorship, against censorship, against bourgeois morals, but also against the conservative character of high literature and the culture industry. In a very innocent manner, Fernanda Laguna and Cecilia Pavón, the founders of Vegis y Felicidad, discovered this literature accidentally on a holiday trip to Bahia, northeast Brazil. There, they encountered the Lojas de Cordeo, um, tiny shops in which little booklets are sold together with other inexpensive objects of popular culture. This form of minor popular literature inspired one of the most interesting movements in Brazilian countercultural tradition. Poesia marginal, or marginal poetry, can hardly be, be defined as a unified solid movement, but rather a form of production and circulation alternative to the mainstream culture industry. The most salient characteristic of this experiment is the continuity between living an alternative lifestyle, writing about experience, self-publishing and selling. This is a literature centered in the mutation of subjectivity through the intensive use of drugs and psychedelic perceptions and the non-heteronormative experience of the body. It can be described as a micro-political bodily subversion against a state of subjectivity dictated by the military, the church, and family values. Because of their exclusion from the uh, culture industry, these young poets elaborated their own underground circuit of self-publishing with Xerox copies and selling in bars, nightclubs, street fairs, and lojas de cordel, these uh, shops. This reaching out of the literary sphere depended, depended on the handcrafted form of production, and it implied both a rejection of the literary tradition and a fusion with life in terms of the immediacy between living, writing, and distributing. But they also understood literature as a transformative activity, living life as a work of art, as a political subjective mutation, was contagious, and poetry was the medium for this contamination. From this viewpoint, art is subordinated to life. It is at the service of life. One reads and writes to become different, to bring the earth elsewhere home. Marginal poetry was a literary rebellion within the context of a wider micro-political revolution, which marked the origin of politics of desire in Brazil the boom of alternative political organizations such as uh, feminism, LGBT, indigenous African-Brazilian hippies, ecologist movements that flourished in the 70s when the grammar of social struggles shifted from mere conflicts of class to the intersection of issues of power and subjectivity. This form of production also rejected the character of luxury commodity in, with which books are invested in a society with a very high rate of illiteracy, around 30%. The politics of amateur and do-it-yourself production opened the possibility for this writing to exist and to spread the virus of a different possible life in the context of suffocating repression and censorship. This molecular revolution was practically unknown in Argentina if it were not for the role of poet, activist and anthropologist Nestor Berlonger the founder of the LGBT movement in both Argentina and Brazil, who smuggled ideas and texts to and from both sides of the border. In his Brazilian sexual exile, as he would like to call it, Nestor Berlonger was captivated by all this movement, also called the Spongi, uh, which is like debauchery, and the literature that fostered and expressed it, and brought it home with the idea of connecting Latin American neo-baroque literature in a counter-cultural canon that once, in the beginning of my research, I used to call queer, but now I call Las Lenguas de las Locas, or the languages of the locas, as a concept that surpasses the idea of literature and also of the queer. Locas literally means crazy women, but applies to gays, women, trans of all sorts, gender benders, gender facts, non-binary people, outside of patriarchal culture and mainstream subjectivity, feminist bodies. 
Perlonger, founder of the Homosexual Liberation Front in Argentina, the first LGBT group in Latin America, was one of the ideologists of the politics of the locas, which shaped an utopic communion between all of us locas without a normative fixed identity, an alliance between feminists and queers, and a strong Latin American background of poverty and playfulness. Loca is both an antidote to identity, but also to political correctness. It stays in the margins, and from that underprivileged position, the locas shout, scream, and laugh against patriarchy. In political terms, locas are the Madres de Plaza de Mayo, the LGBT activists, and the feminists. The unsubordinated languages of the locas, and I, I, I would not translate it, and I thought, if we use queer in Spanish, why not use locas in English? <laughs> so the unsubordinated languages of the locas are normally excluded from literature and the public sphere, but in the voices of the locas, the political meets the literary as a radical formula of creative subversion. This is why the languages of Elocas are above and beneath literature, and they are immediately connected with emancipatory micropolitics. And yet, despite Berlonger's efforts, this tradition of Locas coming from Brazil did not have a chance to be included in the traditional book circuits. This is why the voices of the locas present in marginal poetry had to wait until the digital transformation of languages and literature to reappear in the context of a crisis of subjectivity, a crisis of the literary as such, and the emergence of queer politics and theory in Argentina. So back to Vergesa y Felicidad. In 1999, Fernanda Laguna and Cecilia Pavón founded Vergesa y Felicidad as a bookstore, a publishing house, an art gallery, inspired both in the Lojas de Cordeo they had discovered in Bahia, the heritage in the lo of the locas enlightened by the queer activism that exploded at that time. They translated the model of marginal poetry to the Argentinian context of neoliberal decay, in which a devastating book industry had no space for anything that would challenge the conservative markets because they could not afford to fail at selling to an audience used either to bestsellers or acclaimed high literature. Very low cost self-publishing appeared then as an alternative to the dictatorship of the free markets. The books edited by Vegesa are quite simple, made of A4 paper and Xerox copies and, costed, and still cost um, 50 cents of dollar. They can be, I'm going to show you some pictures now, they can be as long as the writer wants, or as short, starting from a single page. One poem, poem can be one book. And as in the craft mode of production of the marginal poetry, one can live, write, publish, and sell on the same day. The objective of this, this literature is to live life as a work of art, to live artistically. The focus of the artistic process is not on the work of art as a result, but the in-between, the process, whatever happens between the reader and the book. This is the transformative aspect of this poetics of the locus, the literary effect as a mutation of subjectivity. It is important to know that this poetics of the locus developed as a consequence of the technique of production. For Vegesa, cheap is beautiful. Literature is not intended as a luxury, but as a tool for happiness. Writing was thus emancipated from the burden of success. When producing such small, cheap books, there is no risk of or failure or success in the terms of the market. This mode of production is deeply liberating. Writing stops being a privilege of illuminated minds, or of those who succeed in the market, or who are professional writers. Anyone can write and publish there, regardless of the value, the quality, or the commercial aspect. The inexpensive, crafty character of the plaquettes also allowed them to reach out of the circuits of bookstores and literary readers to be accessible to other audiences, because the books costed so cheap, people would just buy them to give it a try. Um, and these are the, some pictures of Belleza, the, the space Belleza y Felicidad. You see the, the aesthetics of poverty, but also of uh, queerness. These are the 
for the books. This is one of one of the, the books that transformed into a long novel now. The original was called Una chica menstrua cada 26 o 30 días y es normal. A girl has a period between 26 and 30 days and it's normal. <laughs> for instance. Um, Laguna and Pavón, and this is, oh, I'm going to show you the last one. This was a closing party of Regista. They dressed the, the, the space with this knitting and then everybody dressed uh, the same to like make a collective body. Um, Laguna and Pavona were basically trying to make space for themselves as young female writers and artists who were rejected in the mainstream for being girly and were treated like stupid, childish and, and shallow. And we now detect the blatant misogyny of such ill-intentioned comments. But perhaps, as an unexpected effect, they opened up a space for locas, for publishing and for exhibiting, and thus, Bellissa y Felicidad became, in time, a sort of queer feminist mecca. In 2007, when the mecca was internationally recognized and renowned, yet not making enough money to pay for the rates on the rent, Bellissa y Felicidad closed the art gallery and continued functioning until the present as a nomadic publishing house that is so low maintenance that it doesn't even need a room of its own. <laughs> and it doesn't even need to sell. Because there is no copyright, no, no profit, no authorship. Some of the books are anonymous and many are signed by mock pseudonyms. Anyone could Xerox the books and sell them. The, this marginal position in the market did not mean irrelevance in the debates on literature. It was a key platform for launching of new, young, locust writers that could develop their poetics through this experimental, experiential form of publishing that aimed overall to bring people together in new forms of community, very closely linked with the subjective experiments of the queer micro-revolution of 2001. It is worthy to note that the molecular revolution of 2001 created a counterpower that eventually reached the macro politics and these social experiments of queer politics informed progressive state policies such as the law of equal marriage of 2010 and the gender identity law in 2012. So eventually we reached the state. Not for long though. In 2003, still high on the transformative effects of the crisis, this publishing revolution had another twist. Fernanda Laguna, together with writer Washington Cucurto and visual artist Javier Barilaro, founded another anti-capitalist enterprise, the publishing house Eloisa Cartonera. Cartonera means a cardboard reciter. Following Belleza's recipe of a non-commercial production of cheap books, Eloisa literally meant sneaking into the illegal. The original project was named Eloisa, and the books were originally printed in colored paper with the materials and the machines of a public library where Cucurto used to work as a part-time cultural producer. Cucurto used his working class background to create a poetics of the locas articulated with poverty, the voices of Latin American migrants and the aesthetics of cumbia, a very popular tropical music of Colombian origin. Taking these aesthetics further, they started working with cartoneros, cardboard reciters, who became very important social actors after 2001 because most uh, working class people were um, unemployed at that time so they, they had to develop uh, informal uh, economies to survive and one was the, the cardboard recycling industry and now it's uh, very high again. After the crisis which implicated a 73 devaluation of the local currency, the publishing industry collapsed because the price of ink and paper remained at the international rate of the American dollar, while the general purchasing power had dropped dramatically. Books became unaffordable, and many publishing houses and bookstores had to close. So Eliza enacted that drama and started making super cheap books out of cardboard recycled by cartoneros, from whom they used to buy cardboard at five times its market rate. The book's price had originally been set at one dollar and they were handmade by cartoneros who also learned to paint the covers inspired by the Cumbia Records aesthetics. Every book is a unique and original work of art. This is um, a picture of uh, 
one of the first events they hosted at the, the first uh, space they, they had for the Cartolera uh, publishing house was uh, called No hay cuchillos en rosas. It's like a twist of a typical um, Argentinian say that it's No hay rosas en cuchillo, like nothing sweet has uh, its age or something like that. Um, in 2003, this is Fernanda Laguna using um, a cardboard dress and reading. Uh, it was also like a fashion show. And here you can see that this space was also a, um, a grocery store where they would sell uh, onions here, potatoes, and fruits for only for the cartoneros. So instead of being like a, a chic uh, food store, it was uh, a very trashy place. Um, <laughs> And, and pay, of course, very, very cheap. So the models of Eloisa Cartonera are, and these books are, these are the books, also are in the cover of uh, the, the conference newspaper, um, uh, I don't know how to call it. Uh, these books are against libraries, because you can, they, they don't have, um, how do you say, Lomo? Yeah. So you cannot put them together like in, in, a, in a shelf. So you have to accumulate them like that and have a whole collection of units like that in boxes. Um, the models of Eloisa Cartonera are La Editorial Más Colorinche del Mundo, the world's most colorful publishers in the sense of the working class taste. Colorinche is like, in Spanish, like the derogatory. And Nueva Narrativa y Poesía Sudaca Border, New Speak, Border, Narrative and Poetry. Eloisa took the idea of belleza to a new level. It, exceeded the uh, the, it extended the language the lenguas de las locas from only Argentina to Latin America. It focused on the process of production and it spread over the continent first and then globally. Now there are like 200 cartonera publishers around the world. So they literally transformed the world's literary landscape uh, into a new, a whole new dimension. The theme of poverty, and this is again Fernanda Laguna reading uh, a book they wrote collectively, of course a super big uh, cartonera book. They also um, are related to the works of art, and this is where I'm going now. The theme of poverty and Latin Americanization of aesthetics and the circulation of a counter-cultural Latin America canon until then, Argentinian culture was very much European-oriented. So, this reflection on poverty focuses on the material aspect of the box, the raw cardboard showing its origin with the logos of the factories and brands of supermarket products hand-painted in colors, shed light, sheds light on the mode of production, as opposed to ordinary commodities that hide their process of production as alienated labor through commodity fetishism. Eloisa Cartonera has edited and transformed more Latin American locus writers than any other publishing house in the continent and recycled the, classic, the classics of the marginal poetry, Belleza y Felicidad, and Perlonger's modit texts. The catalog has grown to hundreds of books that include new, young, and, gener and generally unknown experimental locus writers, as myself, that would never have an opportunity in the regular market, together with big names that donated their works to support and add prestige to the project. In Eloisa, as well as in Belleza, there is no copyright, no privatization of the language or the literary work or the, translate, the translations. Piracy, with consent only in the case of living authors, is the rule, as well as self-piracy, as anybody could Xerox the contents and hand paint the hardcore cover, as many people did. Both Eloisa and Belleza became the perfect space for the poetic developments of the Lenguas de Locas as a form of immediate political intervention of life and as a functional transformation of the forms and instruments of production in an anti-capitalist, communitarian sense. In this context, the Lenguas de Locas that agitated the micro-political revolution could become writer and literature. Both projects are a safe space to rehearse and articulate the proper expression of the bodily subversions of desire, to shape those subversions and at the same time to create new politics. 
The, poet, the poetic formation of new political languages able to connect the level of the bodies with political discourse is fundamental for a micro-political revolution because what usually happens is that the impulses of rebellion and social transformation, those micro-earthquakes we experience at the level of the body, when formulated linguistically, they crash against a bureaucratized, reified language. The traditional macho macro-political language is unable to connect with the forces of collective desire. And this is a problem of the left wing, for instance. Live to write and write to live more and more intensely to become, these poetics say, seem to say, but not to write to make a living, as life can never be expanded within the frames of the markets. This form of production implies the negation of private property over the language. It emancipates language from commodification and transforms, transforms these writings into a trench for political struggles. This can only happen when it does not matter who's speaking because the book is for free or extremely inexpensive. The languages of the locus, charged with affects and rebellious corporality, also form one of the conditions of possibility of the most contemporary feminist movement born in Argentina and spreading like a virus over the world, ni una menos. This movement was born out of a poetical, poetic, political experiment by creating a collective shout able to amplify feminist claims. Fernanda Laguna, founder of Belleza and Eloisa, is a prominent member of this collective that strategically combines a poetic, uh, a poetic body language with a critical anti-capitalist use of communications technology. This movement created the conditions for the global feminist tide. It can be described as the ultimate development of the lenguas de locas, in terms of the radicalization of bodily poetics by a collective intelligence, liberating language from individual authorship through the politics of friendship and the trans-individual aspect of creativity. This collective shout produced the defamiliarization of patriarchy, and this is the cornerstone of our molecular sensible revolution shaped by new collective anonymous forms of art. This style of collective creativity has inspired a new research live archive project that we call uh, Maria de Santa Maria, High on the Tide, Diary of a Feminist Revolution, conducted by Fernanda Laguna and myself. Deep familiarization, according to the formalist theorist of Agavangard, back in the uh, Russian Revolution, is the main critical effect on, of art on our perception of reality. This is why I propose to call this feminist experiment a post-autonomic political avant-garde, as the avant-garde is not, it's not only the front line of, of an army, the line that is ahead of the existing state of affairs, but also the space in which it is possible to create new lives. The tide challenges the academic languages and calls for new theoretical concepts. It obliges us to think ahead of our time. The future is feminist and it is our responsibility to accelerate and produce the advent of the world to come, of the world we want to live in. Ni una menos, viva nos queremos. And I would like to show you uh, two uh, of our, our amateur uh, propaganda art. Uh, this is a project that Fernanda and myself uh, created called uh, Orgasmathon. It is, it is a call, it actually happened two days ago. Um, it's a call for everyone, uh, all molecular women, to have an orgasm on uh, March the 8th uh, at midnight, so before to start the day with the best positive energy. <laughs> and we politicize uh, pleasure and eroticize politics. So these are the videos, we, they are very amateur, they're full of mistakes, but we created, of course, without knowing much. But um, they, were, they are fun, so hope you enjoy them. <laughs> And now, this is, this is quite professional. Wait until you see the next one. <laughs> this is truly amateur. <laughs> it's in Spanish, right? I will translate. We also wrote like a sort of poem. Oh. Oh. 
An orgasmic way traverses the world. El gemido colectivo atraviesa los usos horarios en una onda expansiva. Recuperamos nuestros cuerpos. Recupera nuestro cuerpo. Nuestro territorio de placer. Tiempo recuperado, tiempo disfrutado. Recupera tiempo y a las 0 horas del 8 de mayo nos unimos en un ritual orgánico. Cada uno desde su casa. Each one where we are alone or together. Whether we can make it or not. We get ready for a, a journey of struggle where we practice the world we want to live in. Let this, let this day will be the first day of our new lives. Or not. <laughs> Cecilia wasn't, I don't think she was able to try and better, she, she, she was laughing so much. <laughs> um, so my name is Natalia Lisuela and uh, I wanted to thank you all for being here and I wanted to thank Julia and Lauren um, for organizing this and for inviting me to be a respondent to these two extraordinary papers. Um, uh, this was my first time listening to these papers so I don't have any uh, very you know, elaborate uh, response uh, at this point, but I do have a couple of thoughts that uh, came up as I was listening uh, to both of the papers, because of, I mean, and just to start with something I hadn't even yet written down, which is those two uh, amateur videos, as you called them, you know, uh, give us the, the collapse of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the emergence of the new world, which is so it's like, well, suddenly, it, you know, because I kept thinking about your initial images and how high-tech they were while I was listening to Cecilia and looking at her images and thinking about her use of this kind of a girly PowerPoint, you know, almost like Victorian frame to her thing. Now I was like, well, that is such an interesting contrast. And then they seemed to come together in the you know, female, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the feminist tide of the uh, global female orgasm um, world. Uh, but uh, my, my comments were, were a little uh, elsewhere for now. But one, one of them was just I would really like you two to talk to each other about that way in which uh, your visuals were so different. Because even though uh, Gail started by recognizing that this question of post-collapse uh, world has always already happened in the um, parts of the world that lived through colonialism and imperialism, which is the vast majority of the world, um, uh, there is a way in which the rest of your uh, argument, um, or at least the way it got mapped out, I kept thinking that is one can think of that world from a very specific place. One can think of that collapse from a very specific place. Which then hearing Cecilia's talk, it reminds us of that because it's like in Argentina, we have always already been living in this collapse. Whether it's an environmental collapse because as we know, you know, these extractive economies, that is what they have done. Like we have been living in uh, environmental uh, collapse for the last century at least, right? And so I was wondering if the difference in your images, in your choice of images, visuals, you know, the high-tech um, maps that you began with could somehow enter into a conversation with these girly, um, low-tech uh, images that Cecilia uh, offered her presentations through as a way of thinking about these politics of the collapse mm -hmm. in a kind of global south and global north um, uh, paradigm. 
Um, the other thing that kept resonating with me in both of your presentations is the idea that somehow, in, for both of you, in what you studied, um, the future, the possibility of a futurity is in the past. So for in Gail's presentation, that past is the radio, right? Like going back to a kind of a, a minor a medium to, in today's world, right? And in Cecilia's a presentation, that future of the past is like in the specific context of post-economic and political collapse in Argentina 2001, it's going, going to like a 1970s um, model, right? The Xerox copies, which in themselves in the 1970s were the recuperation of a 19th century practice that had begun in Northeastern, which is Afro-Brazilian um, Brazil, right? So this question of the future of the past in this um, a moment of global collapse, right? What does that mean? Um, uh, because your your presentation, Gail, was so anchored in the question of temporality, right? Um, specifically, but thinking about both of them, you know. And then I was thinking and wondering, Gail, if you could bring gender. A thinking about gender or about post-gendered subjectivities in this a possibility that you offer of a world, you know, post-collapse that would find its future in the past of radio um, and the relationship of radio and you even say, you know, I think of radio telenovelas and, and the long history that radio has had to the female voice. Right? Yeah. So I was wondering if, if that could be thought together. And then um, maybe the, the last kind of large topic in, that I wanted, that I found uh, resonated with those papers was the question um, of poverty. Right? Because in a way both, I mean, whether it's in the case of a Cecilia's presentation that speaks specifically from Latin America, but that could be mapped out to most a, post-colonial spaces, right, we have always all already been living in poverty. That is the sustained um, a reality, right? But the collapse that you are mapping um, is very much the collapse of the North thinking about what it means to enter into poverty, right? Um, and poverty not only in economic and material terms, in, in broader terms, uh, you know, uh, as well. Um, so that in poverty, the question is always survival, right? Um, what and who survives? And the fact that perhaps what is offered uh, in both of your papers in very different ways is that what survives is the minor. But it is the minor that has insisted on remaining minor and never becoming major, which has been the case, say, of when we think today, who still practices radio? And who still listens to the radio, right? You're kind of like against the tide of your time. <laughs> so that, in that sense of you know, remaining minor, and in the sense of Cecilia, this question of like uh, uh, feminist queer, and what you today are calling loca subjectivity, that has insisted on remaining in that marginal, um, non-central, non-commodified subjective place, right? So it seems like survival uh, in poverty is only possible by remaining in a way in the poorest of places. Um, so those were kind of my general thoughts, but, but maybe there's things that you could respond to or, or talk about if, if you felt like it or if not, we can ask the public first. Yeah. Yeah. But I enjoyed very much your presentation, Gary, and uh, collapse, poverty, like so many, so, uh, many terms in common. Um, and it's very interesting, this uh, imagination of the future as a past, and um, also that uh, an apocalypse or, or the collapse is uneven, right? Because for us in Argentina, we experience collapse every 10 years. So we are very used to collapse. 
And actually, uh, collapse, as also you suggest uh, in the end of your presentation, is the, the possibility of creating something radically new. Uh, it's a possibility of actually uh, getting out of capitalism. And when we were, we were talking, I was thinking, well, I hope internet falls at once, <laughs> really, because it, uh, it's the only way we can uh, reshape our societies. Um, talking about the, the future as, uh, as the past, uh, this is a very important issue, both in Medellín uh, Felicidad and in Luisa Cartonera and in the marginal poetry of Brazil. Uh, in terms of uh, imag well, imag the imagination of the new always, of modernity especially, always is a relation with the archaic. It's a, it, the imagination of the future always needs inspiration from the past. We cannot imagine something radically new out of the blue. Um, we always go backwards. And uh, in the case of Vegas and Felicidad, for instance, uh, it, was, it started in 1999, which was the moment in which internet became massive in Argentina. So instead of uh, working with the cutting edge latest technology, they chose to work with an old technology, but with the shape of the new at the same time. These, uh, these plaquettes, that could be only one poem or maybe one sentence only, was uh, so cheap and so easy to acquire, so easy to produce, that it was almost like a Facebook post or a post on any social network. And the ephemeral character of, of uh, these publications also resembled this, the, the timing of internet, but all in an old technology. Um, also the idea that this democratization of false democratization that the internet produced in the practices of writing that now everybody writes, we are writers, photographers, whatever, um, and we don't care about the quality, we just upload our bullshit and that's it. <laughs> we just care about the likes, but not... <laughs> uh, this idea that quality is not uh, a problem any longer also relates to uh, internet and not to, to the, the, the book industry, for instance. For which quality, name, uh, prestige is the most important and otherwise you don't exist. Um, so this imagination of the future uh, in the past is uh, the key. In a moment of collapse, because in 2001 I didn't explain it at the moment, but there was uh, a terrible financial crisis, the whole financial system collapsed, literally. The country uh, could not pay any longer the interest of the external debt. So the whole economy collapsed, the banking system collapsed, there was no cash, people were, uh, even the state would pay with these bonuses invented out of nowhere. There were like five currencies at some point. Uh, during one, one week there were five presidents. They would take power and uh, quit in, on the same day. <laughs> so it, it was hilarious because, uh, and also uh, so apocalyptic that we say, okay, anything is possible now. This creative, uh, created a revolution, a sensitive revolution, and micro political revolution that then ended up in a process of uh, 12 years of uh, a progressive government. So this counter power created a, a new power through chaos and through this uh, imagination of, of, of apocalypse, right? Um, and poverty. Poverty was at the core of all these productions. And I uh, much uh, imagine this idea. I always download things and print things because I always fear that internet might collapse. And even with Fernanda Laguna, we are, have this uh, project of this live archive of feminism and art and feminist avant-garde that we want to collect everything that is produced. Like now we produce our own things to collect them, like the orgasmathon. <laughs> but the project is now one year long, uh, so it's changing. But the idea to form an archive that you could spread, that you could all, an archive that is. Uh, based on piracy also. So it, it has a utopic uh, thing and, and um, it is very interesting to see those experiments that happened already in the peripheries and I also think that there is a, a YouTuber, I think she might be from Philippines or Thailand, we never know, maybe you know her, he said, well she, he, uh, they, 
uh, who uh, is like a model who uh, like walks uh, the catwalk, the runway with uh, I don't know banana trees, but super fabulous with all the absolute poverty. You see, like absolute poverty in the context, like with fishiness, like with like they use, she uses, they use this as uh, amazing dresses and like glamour, the gl ultimate glamour of poverty. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in, in our context, this collapse already happened mm -hmm. and they opened uh, the possibility of something uh, amazing. And also this idea of the radio, mm -hmm. going back to minor genres, to genres that uh, nobody pays attention to, but they have a lot of potential. Well, thank you for uh, your... Yeah, and thank you for that amazing talk. And I really do see our ideas in close conversation with each other. So thank you, Natalia, for bringing up several key ways, you know, aesthetics, history, gender, um, media, uh, medium specificity that, uh, that they could relate. I think that your paper helped me to um, identify or you know it, it will help me now to clarify that when I say post collapse or culture post collapse what I really mean is culture without market culture without market driving distribution especially so I am not being attentive to production why because the same kinds of audiovisual production we have now for now can only exist under a market. I mean, we can't amass $350 million after collapse. Like, and we won't want to, and moreover, we won't have to. And your paper illuminates why. <laughs> because in the most impoverished circumstances, we have culture, that's why. Because cultural production is not going to be a problem in any period of human existence. Humans will create culture. So what kind of culture might be a question but I'm not interested in questions of production for now. You know, what I'm really interested in is questions of preservation and distribution because I think that we haven't quite thought out the idea of non-market distribution very well. But I think your paper does, and it looks to a really great set of um, innovations, experiments, startups, entrepreneurial experiments that are you know, queer and feminist and impoverished and about explicitly a non-market form of getting culture out to a lot of people or to whoever's interested. So I think the radicalness of trying to think about peer-to-peer um, -peer distribution without a market that is still resting on some technologies, be they, whatever technologies we will have at hand, by the way, I mean, whatever technologies we have had at hand have been performance, we always have that technology, have been things like costuming and props which aid performance, but also things like um, print is not out of reach, uh, e even in the most dire circumstances, uh, sound distribution is not out of reach, even in an impoverished circumstance, and you know, the, what you're saying about minor cultures, I mean, we do have a major sound culture now, which is podcasts, so there are people listening a form of radio a lot today. But you know, I think that you're right to think about compressed, cheap, uh, accessible technology that could still platform a non-market-based cultural distribution mechanism. And that is the kind of thinking that I think collapse theory is good for. In other words, this isn't like an emergency plan or like first aid kit, like, oh my gosh, you guys, it all fell apart, like oil's really expensive, now what do we do? It's not really that, it's really like an experiment in thinking, um, what is possible after capitalism? Like you're saying, or what is possible in, if we were to acknowledge that capitalism is broken, which we could acknowledge that today if we had the will, you know? <laughs> or sometimes, like in Argentina and in many other places in Greece, you know, we, we have had to acknowledge that. It is forced upon us that capitalism is broken, or if billions of us have to acknowledge it all at once or in a compressed span of time, like let's say 10 years, if the, if the recognition is forced upon us that it is broken, what is the radical thinking that we can undertake to see beyond that framework which is so limited? And it's not like capitalism, capitalism is the enemy, of course, but you know, more than capitalism being the enemy and revolution being the answer, it's really, and this is what I really love about your paper, it's really much more about humanity. It's not about what oppresses us, you know? It's more about like what you said, like right, right to live 
and right to life. It's like that. It's like, how can, what is culture? Culture is us bringing ourselves into being, into human being much more, much more fully for each other, um, demonstrating our humanity to each other, you know? And there's lots of things that prevent that. <laughs> So how can we form systems or platforms or uh, networks that more facilitate um, a kind of fuller expression of uh, who we are, who we really are, who we want to be? And I think that that's the possibility beyond collapse, or that's the kind of thinking that collapse theory um, permits us. And you have shown that in those moments of like radical poverty, radical thinking, and radical performing and radical restructuring of how we get culture to one another is really like you keep you both in for a broad school possible. What the possible reveals itself. And um, that is what is so great about it, you know. Uh, there's such a masked or veiled quality, as Marx would say or Derry Dahl would say, there's such a covering over of possibility by what exists and what dominates. So, um, so much of demystification is trying to pierce that veil. So much of how we try to teach is about ripping away that, um, you know, that this is the box that you've always lived in, so this is the only house that you can ever live in. So much of us trying to puncture that. But in addition to that, I think the job of scholarship today is to also try to really make manifest and tangible and very uh, attainable uh, those alternate possibilities. So those are just some ways that I think our works are very much uh, in dialogue. So thank you. It's great to hear that. So, yeah. I'd like to add something on the radio that yeah. uh, internet, of course, is uh, the main uh, uh, line of distribution in, by the first world. In Latin America, for instance, internet is not available in all the regions, mostly in only the big cities in the countryside. They don't even know what internet is. And most people listen to radios. So I would say that the majority of the population that live in rural areas uh, and, and, and in very, very impoverished areas, uh, radio has a very important uh, function still now. And also the community radios are very important in the transmission of underground ideas, cultures. Now with my uh, feminist activism, I, I give interviews to radios, I don't know where, all the time. and I. This is how I got to knew that there is a whole radio movement and also in Venezuela and, and a grassroots uh, resistance movement mm. for the peasants and, and the people who are outside this main distribution uh, of internet. There is a luxury in most places on earth. It's not like it's taken for granted. Oh yeah, and I also wanted to run up, since you both are bringing up this, I, this, this um, importance of radio, that uh, radio in this country began as an amateur form of distribution. So before, I mean the FCC Federal Communications Commission wasn't like born, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't created once Alexander Graham Bell was like, and here's how communications is going to work. It was more um, something that was created to co-opt an amateur network. Amateurs were running radio um, you know, stations, basically, uh, like YouTube vloggers, out of their you know, barns and trying to contact each other. And I think that there is still something deep in the cultural memory of that technology that is many-to-many -many communication. So radio is very different than film or broadcasting or even books, like published books, because it was always many-to-many -many inherently, and it began as a many-to-many, -many, as a peer-to-peer -peer culture. So I do think that um, there's something quite, it's partly the affordances of the network, but perhaps even deep in the way that we listen to radio or the way that we use radio, something deeply peer-to-peer -peer about it that no, we know we don't have to rely on corporations or governments or regulations in order to have that. Whereas we always relied on those systems for film, you know? So I think there's something quite beautiful about radio as, um, as a as a form of amateur connection uh, that we have always known that's what it is, and we always know we can have that uh, anywhere, at any, you know, almost anywhere, almost any time. I'll take um, questions from the audience. I think there's a, a microphone that's going to be going around, so if I could remind people to say their names. 
um, when before they ask their questions, so that it gets recorded, and, but also or not recorded, but so that we all can hear each other and know who we all are. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm I'm Megan. I'm uh, in the performance studies program here. Uh, thank you both for amazing talks, and thank you, Natalia, for a great response and bringing up some important points. I want to actually take a minute to come back to the amateurism, uh, but the term itself, because Cecilia, in the beginning of your talk, you brought up amateurism or underground, is what you said, and then it came up again just now with um, underground radio transmission. So I was wondering if maybe both or all three of you or whoever wants to, uh, could speak about what the relation between amateurism and underground is. And also, <coughs> these are all my own personal interests, but uh, how distribution fits in if we're working in a framework of amateurism versus in a framework of the underground. Well, in my case, um, I approached the amateurism concept from the perspective of um, the commodity. That is, are you getting paid for this or not? Right? When we say, like, especially in English language, like, oh, you are an amateur. Like, you, you would never, uh, you're not a professional. Like, you, you would never get paid for this. Right? So, uh, this is why I, I started the idea of something that is very cheap or a form of art. Uh, that would not uh, be profitable. This led me in, uh, immediately to the underground system of uh, circulation, but also not only the circulation, because Teresa Cartonera, for instance, is worldwide famous, but it's still minor. It's still, um, even if most uh, researchers or literature know about this, of course, very few people actually talk about it. So it's a question of hierarchy, and the idea that because this is trash, this will always uh, will never make money, and, and, and you're out of the business. So I, I think uh, amateurism is something that is not related to business, and, and therefore is like uh, put in an underground position. Uh, I would say in my context that I am basically suggesting that what is I don't know about that term amateur, but what is underground, what is underground today, underground forms of um, DIY, peer-to-peer, -peer, hacker facilitated distribution today could become overground. Um, and I'm wondering about this term minor, which I'm hearing, you know, Deleuze and Guattari's use of minor literature in how both of you are using it, that whether underground to overground and minor to major could be, are those parallel or are those the same, or are we talking about the same thing, you know? When I think about the mesh network in Athens, and there's also a large mesh network in Spain, those are two economies that co totally collapsed in 2008, and I think those are not accidents, that the mesh networks are so big in both of those countries right now, and that they had that chance and that space to grow, gain subscribers, have people willing to dedicate time to build them out technically, build them house to house, you know? That I think that what happens in a time of collapse is that opportunity arises, the possible arises for something that used to be underground and really illegal. I mean, used to be the kind of thing that like some telecom company would come and maybe strip out technology from your house if you were leeching off of some broadband network, you know? But all of a sudden, in the state of collapse, the telecom no longer cares. They're not gonna go to your house and rip out the mesh network. They're just gonna let that go. So I think there are these opportunities for what was underground to become overground and to become even like the dominant infrastructure. And that those underground learnings, like I have found in online media fandom, that what used to be subcultural, what used to be quite marginalized, what in a time of major transmediation that has become so important to the core Hollywood industry, the practices, the cultural practices and repertoires, the know-how that used to be sort of underground, marginal or illegal, all of a sudden become the centerpiece, the keystone, the, the cornerstone. I mean, I know that you've seen this in the art world, that what used to be underground film distribution, all of a sudden is what makes museums, because all of a sudden they're what draw audiences to the physical site of the museum. And they, you know, you can create events around those and special 
occasions and guest talks. So it's like these practices that circulate at the periphery all of a sudden can you know, penetrate right to the center. And um, that is an important move, but I'm not quite sure, I personally, the terminology seems a little vague for me right now between underground, overground, you know, marginal center, uh, minor, major, um, illicit, licit, like I guess I would have to work through any distinctions between those, but I am hearing echoes in our language. Yeah, and just to respond to that, I thought, well, maybe the question is always the, the market. And you said, you know, these minor or underground penetrating those other overground, did you say? Or whatever, uh, uh, above ground, I don't know what you're doing. Um, but maybe it's not only penetrating, but being co-opted and being, being utilized and transformed. I mean, this is what Adorno would say of the culture industry, right? There, there, it's like, it is such an enormous machine oh, and that it won't. Thank you, yes. So that is exactly that Adorno thinking that, you know, culture industries, Frankfurt School thinking of how it's going to work, how the culture industries are always going to work. Yeah, I'm interested in the tipping point that breaks that. That, you know, right now the culture industries and uh, Adorno and Horkheimer were so good at forecasting this. Uh, have, been, have been excellent at incorporating, as Gramsci would say, incorporating all of those underground and subcultural marginal practices. But what but collapses the moment, meaning like the collapse of the market as well as the infrastructure that supports market-driven activity, collapses the moment when that incorporation either cannot happen or, or there's just a lassitude about, like there's no profit to be made anymore from incorporating. So incorporating is no longer the next move made. And the next move made can be, I'm not saying it will always be, but can be something like a really cool radical queer feminist bookstore or zine store opening, you know? Like it can be more like, oh, we're gonna occupy this space. And uh, because nobody else is and nobody else wants it. Uh, I see this a lot with art collectives in Russia right now where what is there a lot of space? What is there none of money? What is there a lot of young artists? What is there none of money to pay them? <laughs> and so, you know, they occupy these spaces in essence for free because there isn't a market to incorporate those spaces yet. And there isn't a way to turn those young people's art into money yet. But Russia is one of those mixed economies where it could be, it could be incorporated eventually. Um, collapses that moment, I guess, when um, for even if it's provisional, like you're seeing in Argentina, if, even if the collapse is not a permanent, forever collapse, where in those moments um, the next move is not incorporation, but like an overtaking. Oh yeah. Just because I'm not sure how much time. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I just wanted to, to add something to the to this question. Of course, anything uh, coming from the periphery is what well, no avant-garde or nothing new will come from you know Fifth Avenue, New York, or uh, any mainstream and wealthy place. Of course, anything produced in the periphery can be incorporated, captured, captured by the, the, the by the cultural industry. Of course. But always there is a possibility that I see in the work of this artist, Fernanda Laguna. She is now in the mainstream, she has an exhibition in the LACMA, and when well, you come in one in the MoMA, I mean, in, in the big museums of the world, but she keeps a, an amateur practice on the side. Like, you know, this kind of video that we were just laughing to tears when making them, and, and we make, you know, just for that, and to, so people would laugh. Probably, if she, if she thought, I'm going to sell this to you know, the MoMA, it would be a completely different thing. But it, even in prof uh, amateur artists that became professional, they, they uh, can keep their know-how. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can step out all the time. And this is why I, I, I was talking about an avant-garde of post-autonomy. Post-autonomy is not something you choose. It's something it happens. It's the conditions of production. But the avant-garde is a decision of the artist mm -hmm. to break with everything, right? Mm -hmm. So even in, in times of that anything new will be immediately taken by the market, there's always a possibility of stepping out, of taking this idea of doing things just for the sake of doing them or for political reasons and to keep this, uh, this edge out of uh, you know, the commercial system. This is 
great and continues to be great. But I think maybe there's one word that's lacking in this conversation, and it's mobility and flow. Because what is today progressive radio, I mean, I'm thinking of the case in the United States, KPFA, alternative radio, which was taken over by the right as hate radio, and look at the consequences of what they have done and continue to do. There's always this movement, I was thinking also in Argentina, right? What Fernanda and others, people in the poetry world, put together with these kind of precarious alternative presses, turned into boutique presses, and now in Argentina, many of those boutique presses are high rolling, very expensive, very, very elegant productions, not meant to be precarious at all, but to jump in the market. And I think we're always experiencing that back and forth. And maybe what Abigail proposed, the idea of seizing it in the moment and studying it and seeing how maybe you can keep it, keep it outside, is maybe what we're trying to do. But anyway, no more. Or to, um, yes, I'll, I'll, yes to all of that, and also to identify what we're already doing. That, in other words, like, yeah, you know, to, we're talking about future and past quite a bit, like the future is the past, but also let's keep a history of what, we've, what we are already engaged in, what we've already tried, what has already been made manifest, and, and the know-how, what it took to do those things, or what it's taking right now, even if you know how to use a VPN, which everybody should learn how to use a VPN just for your own digital privacy, okay? But, you know, let's say you don't know how to do that, but some of you know how to do that. Good, those of you that know how to do that know something about how to preserve the culture that we have today. So, like, it's not some future thing, you know? It's like, and the, the presses are not some prospective, like, oh, in some ideal queer feminist Argentinian future, we're going to do all that. It's like, we already did that. We've already had these practices going um, kind of for a while, so to recognize the pastness of this like future oriented work and to know that that whatever future we're going to we, we've like we've already been building that it just hasn't always been permanent it just hasn't always managed to seize the center it hasn't always managed to like win the day or overturn the market or whatever but provisionally at the edges in small ways in personal ways we've always been doing all these things that can give us a community beyond market so it's not like we have to wait for the revolution, I guess. Well, it's almost like anti-revolutionary thinking. Um, like, let's, not, you know, of course we can always rise up, yay, let's rise up. But in addition to let's rise up and overthrow, let's also just do what we love to do. Let's do what we love to do in small, in private, with people we like, in our little communities, with the people that get us, you know, that we feel safe with. Let's just do that and recognize that what that is, is culture, is a way of getting culture out and around and keeping it alive. And I think as long as we honor ourselves that way, there isn't a future that can defeat all the good stuff, you know? Like part of my message about collapse is like, it's good to talk about collapse because I know that it's not gonna end culture. <laughs> it's like culture's definitely gonna survive as long as we don't give in to the market's rhetoric of sort of these like terminal disasters that will happen if corporations fall. As long as we don't give in to that thinking, or as long as we can break out of it, it's, you know, we'll make our own system. Uh, I'm Chaz, and I'm an undergraduate. So, like, as an art studio major, um, the the meaning of amateurism is just kind of funny because, like, as a person who's trying to find new mediums to work with, I'm an amateur all the time. Like, I have no idea what to do. Like, you know, I fight with a lab tech all the time on how to use this because, you know, things are possible, but should they be done? Who knows? We're supposed to ask that question. And to like add some hope to both of your like collapse and for the future and whatnot, there's a guy, I can't really name him, but there's a guy who I'm friends with in UC Davis that um, I've watched him do this and I've helped him do this, but he built something that's akin to a scanner that you can put books on. And as in, you can put like old books and they will be like be uh, spined down and like be up. 
and then you just press it onto the scanner and it scans the page and it's high res. And it's piracy. And it's, it's, a, it's a slightly higher tech version of the cardboard books. And also, it came because his professor was just like, I'm too lazy to go to the library and these books are due soon, so like, I don't have time, so let's go pirate these books. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think there's, there's, there's hope is, is the thing. It's just like, we're gonna do something about it, whether or not. Like some, so we should, but we were gonna do it. We're gonna do it. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, great, wonderful. Uh, I'm Stephanie Sihuko from the Art Practice Department. My question had to do with this idea of amateurism and a kind of positive resistance in the sense that when I think of the word amateurism, I see it actually encompassing, you know, everything from populist, uh, you know, p potentially, um, you know, fringe right-wing groups. And I know that today the, uh, the uh, symposium is specifically uh, focusing on uh, uh, issues of race, class, and gender. But I was just curious about, you know, if you enter into the conversation, the parallel kinds of negative forces of amateurism with that. You know, it's, I'm really curious what that looks like because then all of a sudden you have these serious fringes, you know, in parallel production with maybe the middle completely gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, oh, definitely uh, amateurism can point to the dark side of uh, this democratization of uh, the broadcasting system into its, uh, the network of internet and we know that this produced well, the possibility of this precedent that this country has now. Um, uh, uh, but I think this is the risk of any, any uh, radical practice, right, can be appropriate. Well, in, in the case of uh, internet, it's in, uh, incredible how it can produce uh, and I was very um, optimistic at the, at the beginning of, of the internet uh, with the possibilities uh, for uh, creative purposes and then we had Trump, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, in, the, in our group, you know, I mean, we work a lot with uh, the, the communications technologies in, in a critical use, but also we are harassed all the time by, by trolls and, 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 you know, we see publications of fascist zines and, and but it's like they also occupy the, the, the techniques that they see uh, that are, are available for, for you know, those who are left apart uh, and, and, and isolated right, from, from the mainstream. Um, but I think, well, at this moment, this is a, the critical moment, right? Uh, we'll see how far uh, this, this might get, but you definitely have a point. Yeah, and I absolutely think that the that we have also seen left wing moments of um, amateurism that have worked, like the progressive movement in this country in the late nineteenth century and the socialist movement in this country in you know the twenties. Like sometimes it's the leftists that are not complacent, and sometimes it's the rightists that are not complacent. And since maybe uh, oh, I don't know, I mean. I think there has, been, I think there is, I hate that term, the liberal media that the alt-right constantly throws out, like they're attacking this giant, aggregate, left-wing media, I wish that media existed, you know, I don't see that media anywhere, but somehow that's the straw man enemy of the alt-right, along with the university, that's the other enemy of the alt-right. And I think that there is something to perhaps um, more social justice-oriented people um, not having felt empowered to seize their own media as much. I mean, I don't, I, I feel like the energy on the alt-right side has been we have got to seize these tools for ourselves and propagate our message in a very deliberate way. And on the progressive side of things, I don't know that we felt that urgency until now, until this moment of, um, now we are in an emergency, it's like past urgency. Now we must try to seize those tools and use our media to our advantage. Um, I don't. I think that there is a real danger as resources become more scarce of fear-based messages 
at which you know can lead to a lot of violence and a lot of ethnocentric sort of ethno cleansing type messages. I think there is a lot of possibility for that. And um, in times of crisis where resources are scarce, scapegoats are the easy answer, and we've seen that again and again. So if history repeats itself, which it tends to do, I definitely see more, even more, than we are seeing right now. Like the, the sort of alt-right things that seem so extreme right now, I see that becoming very center, possibly. So that's another way that I think we who do what we do now, who are interested in a human-centric, inclusive, progressive mode of preserving and maintaining and spreading culture, our culture that expresses us, I think that we who are doing those things now with that know-how and those practices really have to be very deliberate in honoring what we are already doing. That's more of my message of sort of like, giving it a name, having recognition, not feeling, you know, it's like these, not feeling like if you're queer or pirate, or fan, or hacker, not feeling like you therefore must exist in the shadows and must hide yourself and must be illicit all the time, but feeling like I'm doing something that I know is advancing what I think is sort of the overall project. And I, I know what those practices are, even if they have to be illicit for now, but I know that they're becoming less and less, um, they're, becoming, they're becoming less and less the margin, um, just by virtue of how the whole thing's going. Uh, what I am doing can help other people in the future. So that's, that's just about more for me about like, honoring, acknowledging, naming, like even naming the poets who built that space, you know? Like even keeping those names alive and what they did alive. The things that scholars do to archive things and to keep repertoires alive. I think all of those are so very important right now. And not to let the loudest voices that are fear-based and are interested in, lim in limiting the few resources that are left or whatever, not let those voices rise to the very top. Um, that's big. So, and just to add yeah. uh, one thing uh, that you had, you, I think the key word to think this amateurism, the dark side of amateurism is alt right. Yeah. Right? Because alt right is possible because these techniques are available. Right? And, and no technique is good or bad inherently. Right? They can, they can be tools for something else, but of course they can be reused by you know, whomever with whatever intentions. Um, I'm Jace. I actually work in book publishing, so this is a kind of amusing engagement with it. But um, my question actually follows pretty nicely from our current thought track. Um, I kind of latched onto um, some balance between uh, anonymity and intimacy in both of your um, papers. And I'm kind of curious, I guess, especially in re reference to like illicit activity of piracy and what it's a very different relationship to um, anonymity in the two but um, I guess the value as well as sustainability of it is it a necessity or in this um, becoming overground as you might say um, of any of these activities um, will we see it or, or is anonymity still valuable or is it something especially in our current internet culture mm -hmm. anonymity is such a kind of negative thing where people hide behind it in order to you know all right or even just uh, these violent utterances um yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. personally i think that pseudonymity is the way to go um both on the in terms of rightist activists like gamer bros or like weave or some formal person like that um i think i've read i'm sure i've seen weave's real name this is a terribly destructive hacker who has forced a lot of women in tech totally offline just through harassment and mobilizing troll armies, for example. Um, so like, if somebody like Weave can have the kind of power behind his name that he has, then lots of pseudonyms can have that kind of power. Like, I don't know the name of the person who runs Sci-Hub, but I know she is um, an Eastern European scientist and a woman a young woman who cannot can no longer travel because um, Elsevier has basically you know put out an extradition warrants for her all over the world. Um, but I feel like 
Piracy is a community that functions under pseudonyms. Fandom is an online community that functions under pseudonyms. Those pseudonyms have power and there is force behind them. People can identify what those pseudonyms mean. There's also power in collective pseudonyms. And I think that's how medieval oral culture used to work. I think there was a lot of power behind storytelling communities that we might only have the name of that group or you know the, the place where that story came to us from. And we don't really, can, we can't name all the individual authors or names didn't work that way or whatever it was. But I do think that we can have a good pseudonymous culture that does something to maintain privacy and perhaps even erases individuality through having collectives be pseudonymous. And then I think that is a functional system that the internet has already allowed us to develop and, 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 um, become, and you know, level up to become quite a sophisticated pseudonymous culture that I think can become actually a mainstream you know, norm of face-to-face -face interaction too. That's one of my hopes for the future is that we're learning how to do that boundary of privacy, individuality, versus collective publicness. I think as awkward as it has been online, we are learning something about that online. Well, in my case, when I talk about anonymity or, or pseudonymity, uh, it was not a, about a, a policy, like a politics of, like a deliberate uh, politics of uh, authorship, uh, but it was more like a, something against literature, because literature, modern literature, there is no other literature that is not modern, because of course it's a modern institution, but um, it's based on, on the idea of uh, a penal, how do you say? Penal, propia penal. That's a very technical word. It's a, it's a matter of criminal justice at some point, because books started to be to require to have an author in the moment in which the author could be punished for what he or she was publishing. Before that, like, the class, I don't know, so many classics of literature, they're anonymous, from the golden age, you know, from all times. Yeah, uh, beginning in the 18th century is when books had to be authored with a name, right? So it was more like a, a, a regulation politics, right, authorship. And then came the idea of private property, copyright, etc., as an effect of this uh, this legal uh, binding, right, uh, of punishment. Uh, in this, in the cases of Eloisa uh, Cartonera or Belleza Felicidad, they challenged the idea of literature based on authorship. In terms of who cares, because there is no. Uh, there, you, you won't make money because you will sell the books at 50 cents. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. The copyright becomes irrelevant. And this was like a, you know, like playing a game, inventing names, people would publish, Fernanda, for instance, published uh, with some friends, they decided to use uh, uh, pseudonyms like flowers to name themselves after flowers, just as, a, as an internal joke between friends. And they started using these pseudonyms until, for instance, now she only, uh, Dalia Rossetti is the pseudonym she uses to, to write. She has published six books already. Uh, and as an artist, she uses her name Fernanda Laguna, because it's a commercial name now. But in the writing, she keeps using the pseudonym, because she said, well, I might make a living as an artist. I can just play with literature. I don't mind, because literature also in Argentina is such a, in Latin America, in Spanish language I would say it's such a small market, it's not very different from the English speaking world, where here it is a big business. There is a business for a very few. Uh, most people don't make money out of books or cannot make a living out of books. Very, very few people could only make a living out of selling books. So uh, it was more like a, you know, a, a challenge to what were the rules of literature, but not that it's a politics of uh, any sort, I would say, or, or not intentionally like that. Uh, very dynamic conversation. Uh, we're going to 
move in a second out to the patio to watch a dance performance, and I just want to briefly introduce that. Um, we're going to watch a hip-hop team called Identity X, which was founded in 2013 by Victor Dinas and Shasuka Matsudo here at Berkeley, and um, it's gone through many different participants. And today's performers that we'll see are Alan Chen, Ru Guan, Nick Lang, Ashta Patel, Natalie Chow, Jocelyn Su, and Andrew Fong. And just to say something about these hip hop teams that proliferate across campus, um, there's, I think, over a thousand undergraduates who are um, involved in these teams. Yeah, there's dozens of them that form and reform every semester. Um, it's one of the best things, I think, that most faculty and grad students agree about being at Berkeley is the fact that you may be very weary after a long day and you drive yourself to your car and then there's the 35 people dancing um, <laughs> in the parking garage and it's a really, uh, it's an incredible way that public space on this campus gets activated by self, and this is a totally self-organized phenomenon. It has nothing to do with course credit. Um, they have formed their own clubs and now, you know, it's, they have their own network that has been, um, has sprung up out of this uh, entirely invented culture of these hip hop dance teams. And actually, I should say there's many different kinds. The Berkeley dance community is not entirely hip hop. There's many different styles that are practiced. But we're going to watch a hip hop one. Um, and it's a smaller configuration of a larger team. I think they have actually about 35 members um, usually, but it was a Friday afternoon and not everyone can make it. So let's go out to the patio. We'll watch as well. I think it's a five minute set or something like that. And then we'll take a break and we can be at 3.45. 